I had originally planned my next video to be about the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. However, the script is taking forever and it might end up being like a 40 minute video. So in the meantime, I wanted to put something else out. And a few days ago, I was reading Clara Zetkin's uh, document about Rose's relationship with the Bolsheviks and the Russian Revolution. I kind of felt like taking some of the information from, from this would make for a good video. You often see Rosa Luxemburg labeled as a libertarian Marxist. I think the bulk of the time this just comes from people reading the Wikipedia page and never considering it much further. So I kind of wanted to dispel these myths of the giant gap between Rosa and the traditions of Bolshevism. You'll have to forgive the, the dive into history over some of these movements, but I do feel like it's important to understand the relationship between them later. The Russian Social Democratic Labor Party affiliated with the Second International. In 1912, this party split into the Menshevik and Bolshevik Party. Around the same time in 1912, the Basel Manifesto came from an international congress. It put forth that the coming war should be opposed. In case war should break out anyway, it is their duty to intervene in favor of its speedy termination, and with all their power to utilize the economic and political crisis created by the war to arouse the people and thereby hasten the downfall of capitalist class rule. Unfortunately, once war was declared, with the exception of Italy, Russia, and Serbia, all other parties of the participants endorsed their country in war. The news was so devastating to the left wing of the Second International. The German SPD was a massive party. They were the largest party with, within the Reichstag, over a million members. They were the successful Social Democratic Party that many parties looked up to. But when it came to the start of the World War, the party voted unanimously for war credits in the Reichstag. Lenin, when he received the paper announcing that the German SPD had backed war, he was convinced it must have been a fake by the German general staff. Rosa Luxemburg and Clara Zetkin both contemplated suicide in response to these events. However, neither of them did. Rosa began to form what would later become the Spartacus League. While the vote had been unanimous, there were actually 14 deputies who were opposed, but were compelled by party discipline to vote for them. Karl Lipneck was one who opposed it, and he would help form the Spartacus League with Rosa Luxemburg, Paul Levi, Franz Mehring, and Clara Zetkin. Eventually, representatives from various countries who denounced the war began trying to organize and plan a conference to unite the anti-war parties of the Second International. This would become the Zimmerwald Conference. Rosa did not go personally, and Lipnack wrote a letter from, it, from his imprisonment stating his opposition to the war. At the conference, Lenin formed the Zimmerwald Left, an explicitly revolutionary wing of the conference of which was a minority, and even amongst it there were some deep divides. Eventually, a manifesto would be drafted by Trotsky for the conference. To quote a little bit from that manifesto, The war has lasted for more than a year. Millions of corpses lie upon the battlefield. Millions of men have been crippled for life. Europe has become a gigantic human slaughterhouse. All science, the work of many generations, is devoted to destruction. The most savage barbarity is celebrating its triumph over everything that was previously the pride of mankind. Now the task is to enter the list for our own cause, for the sacred aim of socialism, for the salvation of the oppressed nations, and the enslaved classes by means of irreconcilable working class struggle is the task and duty of the socialists of the belligerent countries to begin the struggle with all their power. It is the task and duty of the socialists of the neutral countries to support their brothers by all effective means in the fight against bloody barbarity. Never in the history of the world has there been a more urgent, a more noble, and a more sublime task, the fulfillment of which must be our common work. No sacrifice is too great, no burden too heavy to attain this end, the establishment of peace between the nations. Working men and women, mothers and fathers, widows and orphans, wounded and crippled, to all who are suffering from the war or in consequence of the war, we crowd over the frontiers, over the smoking battlefields, over the devastated cities and hamlets. Workers of all countries unite. Lenin summarized his thoughts on the manifesto in The First Step. In practice, the manifesto signifies a step towards an ideological and practical break with opportunism and social chauvinism. At the same time, the manifesto, as any analysis will show, contains inconsistencies. It does not say everything that should be said. The conference set up a new secretariat in Bern, Switzerland, to act as an intermediary between the affiliated groups. Factions within the various parties who had endorsed the war began to form. This was the foundation of setting up a new international. At this time, we can see that the Spartacus League was involved at Simmervald. We are going to skip forward a bit during these years. Rosa was imprisoned. Hopefully at some point I can come back and make a video or two on the Spartacus League. November 7th, the Russian Revolution, and with it brought the promise to bring an end to the World War. Rosa was imprisoned at the time, and it is during this time she wrote the document titled The Russian Revolution. The important thing to note is Rosa herself decided not to publish this document. It was instead released years later by Paul Levi, who was bitter after being expelled from the German Communist Party. Before I dive into this article, I want, I want to mention as well where some of the ideas of Rosa being a committed anti-Leninist come from. 
In the early 1960s, uh, Bertman Wolf, a former CPUSA member who later worked for the U.S. State Department, published two of Rosa's pamphlets in English. Though he changed the title from what Rosa wrote, the Organizational Questions of the Russian Social Democracy was changed to Marxism versus Leninism, as well as publishing The Russian Revolution, the above-mentioned article that Rosa chose not to publish herself. Rosa's Organizational Questions of the Ro Russian Social Democracy was a response to two of Lenin's articles, What is to be done and One Step Forward, Two Steps Back. I see this often characterizes Rosa attacking democratic centralism, but the phrase never appears once in the pamphlet, and democratic centralism actually originates with the Mensheviks. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, as I think another person, pro-socialism, has already done a very good video on what is to be done. I'll put it in the video description. Please go watch it. It is a very good video. But to make this short, people attempt to paint the tactics listed in what is to be done as Lenin's ideals, policy, are incorrect. To quote Lenin in 1907, the basic mistake made by those who now criticize what is to be done is to treat the pamphlet apart from its connection with the concrete historical situation of a definite and now long past period in the development of our party. If you really want a full breakdown, please go watch the above mentioned video because I want to focus on the document titled The Russian Revolution. And remember, this was not a document Rosa published. This document is broken up into several chapters, which I'm going to go over. Fundamental significance of the Russian Revolution. I'm going to mostly skip over this, though, because it's not really a criticism the chapter ends with. Whatever a party could offer of courage, revolutionary farsightedness, and consistency in a historic hour, Lenin, Trotsky, and all the other comrades have given in good measure. All the revolutionary honor and capacity which Western social democracy lacked was represented by the Bolsheviks. Their October uprising was not only the actual salvation of the Russian Revolution, it was also the salvation of the honor of international socialism. This is something you should keep in mind as we go through the rest. These are not words you would write for someone who you consider your enemy. The Bolshevik land policy. In this chapter, Rosa is criticizing the idea of giving land to the peasantry. She states, Here, the property right must first of all be turned over to the nation, or to the state, which with a socialist government amounts to the same thing. For it is this alone which affords the possibility of organizing agricultural production in accord with the requirements of interrelated large-scale socialist production, though she does give concessions to the smallest of peasants. Of course, it is not necessary to take away from the small peasant his parcel of land. We can with confidence leave him to be won over voluntarily by the superior advantage first of union and cooperation and then finally of inclusion into the generalized socialized economy as a whole. So the key points in Rosa's arguments is that if the peasantry confiscated the land from the large states into their own ownership will become an enemy of socialism. She also talks of the chaos this caused, as well as stating that the decree of the peasants to seize land was taken from another party other than the Bolsheviks. The slogan taken over from much condemned socialist revolutionaries, or rather from the spontaneous peasant movement. This last part is very true. This fact was known to the Bolshevik delegates of the Congress. Many delegates pointed this out to Lenin, who responded, So be it. As a democratic government, we cannot ignore the feelings of the masses, even if we don't agree with them. What also must be kept in mind is the composition of the Congress as well. At the opening of this composition, as was mentioned in my previous video, the Congress was made up of 300 Bolsheviks, 193 socialist revolutionaries, 68 were Mensheviks, and 14 were Menshevik internationalists. The population of Russia must also be kept in at this point. Peasants were the majority of the population, and much of them desired land. The decree of land was less of a law passed that enabled the peasants to seize land and more, of them legalizing what was already happening in the villages. In June of 1917, the peasants had already started seizing land. Opposing this would have been impossible at the time, even if the government wanted to. What Rosa is essentially calling for is forced collectivization of everyone but the smallest peasants. This is without a doubt something some Bolsheviks would have supported at the time, but I really think it would have been impossible to carry out at the time, the experience of the forced collectivization a decade later, I think, shows in part what would have happened had the Bolsheviks not supported the peasants in this. The nationalities question? Opinions on national liberation is somewhere Rosa without a doubt breaks with Lenin on. However, she is actually more in line with a good amount of the Bolshevik party than Lenin. Let's go over Rosa's position on this document. This document gets a bit into Brest-Litovsk, but I want to save that part for my next video. Rosa spends a good amount of time attacking the ideas of self-determination. If, despite all this, generally sober and critical politicians as Lenin and Trotsky and their friends who have nothing but an ironical shrug for every sort of utopian phrase such as disarmament, League of Nations, etc., have in this case made a hollow phrase of exactly the same kind of their special hobby, this arose, it seems to us, as a result of some kind of policy made to order for the occasion. 
Lenin and his comrades clearly calculated that there was no sure method of binding the many foreign peoples within the Russian Empire to the cause of revolution, to the cause of the social, socialist proletariat, than that of offering them in the name of revolution and socialism the most extreme and most unlimited freedom to determine their own fate. Unfortunately, the calculation was entirely wrong. Rosa several times refers to this as a hobby of the Bolsheviks. She expresses and shows a severe dislike to any notion of Ukrainian nationhood. Since the Ukraine never formed a nation or government, was without national culture except for the reactionary romantic poems of Shevchenko, and this ridiculous pose of a few university professors and students was inflated into a political force by Lenin and his comrades through their doctrinaire agitation, concentrating the right of self-determination, etc., to what was at first a mere farce, they lent such importance that the farce became a matter of the most deadly seriousness, not as a serious national movement for which afterward, as before, there are no roots at all, but as a shingle and rallying flag of counter-revolution. She spends more time attacking the Breslatovsk Treaty. I don't know what other option Rosa might have seen. She really doesn't put forth an alternative idea. The options at the table at the time were revolutionary war against Germany, which was supported by Bukharin and others, or peace, which was supported by Lenin. On the question of national liberation, uh, this was not a common opinion of all the Bolsheviks. At the Seventh Party Conference in April 1917, Piatkov and others tried to get rid of the position on self-determination. That proposal failed. He made another attempt at the Eighth Party Congress. The slogan, the right of nations to self-determination, which our party has held to from time immemorial, has shown itself in practice when it comes to the question of the socialist revolution to be a slogan which is a rallying point for all counter-revolutionary forces. Bukharin as well made an argument against the current position on self-determination, but he was not as fully against it as Piatkov was. Lenin made a compromise with Bukharin on this position in order to defeat Piatkov, whose position was much more anti-national liberation than than Bukharin and Rosa Luxemburg. However, Piatkov's attitude was popular with some of the parts of the rank and file. I think given how the failures to properly combat, as Lenin would say, the great Russian chauvinist, really this shows this is possibly Rosa's worst position she expresses in this document. Suffrage, dictatorship, and democracy. These are probably the most often quoted sections of the Russian Revolution. They're often quoted to attack the Bolsheviks to show that they did their revolution wrong, um, that there were distortions in the name of Marxism. This is just very often using the reputation of Rosa Luxemburg as a revolutionary martyr to attack Lenin. Rosa herself, though, was critical of this attitude. Let the German government socialists cry that the rule of the Bolsheviks in Russia is a distorted expression of the dictatorship of the proletariat. If it was or is such, it is only because it is a product of the behavior of the German proletariat. And of itself, a distorted expression of the socialist class struggle. All of us are subjected to the laws of history. It is only internationally that the socialist order of society can be realized. The Bolsheviks have shown that they are capable of everything, that a genuine revolutionary party can contribute within the limits of historical possibilities. They are not supposed to perform miracles. Rosa Luxemburg very much understood that the lack of a German revolution forced the Bolsheviks to fight tooth and nail for protecting the revolution. I'm going to refrain from quoting Rosa much for the, for the rest in the interest of time. You can read these chapters yourself if you would like. But the four main ideas I see are people pulling from these chapters are Rosa was pro-freedom of speech, um, democracy in the form of the Constituent Assembly in Russia, and was critical of the Soviets in that she denounced terror. But we must remember this is a pamphlet Rosa herself never published. Clara Zetkin, one of Rosa's close political collaborators, produced the work I mentioned at the start of this. And this, she goes over the positions Rosa expressed uh, in Red Flag, a paper Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Lipnick edited together for the Spartacus League. From Zetkin, as valuable as the collaboration of other leading Spartacus League members was especially that of Karl Lipnick, without Rosa Luxemburg, the red flag would not have been the red flag. She was a living soul of the newspaper, making it its clearest, most decisive, and fiery voice of the revolution, the unerring beacon for the forward-driven proletariat. Without regard for her poor health, she had suffered greatly during her years in prison, and for emotional shock of the war years, with contempt for and even abuse of her needs— but with every longing obliterated by the one great wish and desire, she gave herself entirely to this task. With scrupulous contentiousness, she took care in each issue the character of the red flag. Its opinion of the issues and demands of the days raised by the revolution would be expressed as clearly and sharply as possible. No news item should appear without its content and form first having been approved and covered by Rosa. So I'm going to take from Zetkin the positions Rosa expressed in her paper during the last months of her life and compare it to the caricature created of her by so many modern people looking to slander the Bolsheviks. 
want to start first with Rose's position on the Soviets and the German Constituent Assembly. At the meeting of the Spartacus League on December 1st, Rosa Luxemburg delivered a speech that won the audience's approval for her point of view as expressed by the following resolution. The People's Assembly called on December 1st, and the Teachers' Union building on Alexander Strasse declared its agreement with the remarks of Comrade Luxemburg. It considers the convening of the National Assembly a step that strengthens the counter-revolution, betrays the proletarian revolution and its socialist goals. It calls for handing over all powers of the workers and soldiers' councils whose first duty is to drive the traitors to the working class and socialism out of the government. In Germany, she strongly opposed any constituent assembly. Thus, in number 26 of Je December 11th, to the Executive Council on number 27th of December 12th, it scourges the Executive Council with the headline, The Executive Council Knuckles Under, and it characterizes the Russian Soviets as a positive example. So we have Luxembourg after the November Revolution in Germany being against the popular democracy of the constituent assemblies and has full support for the German Soviets in the positive example. So let's talk about freedom of speech and the press. Soldiers wearing red emblems entered a bourgeois printing house and confiscated 100,000 leaflets against Bolshevism. It was stamping out of freedom of expression, not to mention assaulting bourgeois property. The condemned red flag can only add to this dreadful event this, this afterward. The soldiers believed that freedom of press did not include freedom to print slanders, and they interrupted the lies of the bourgeois press that it continued for four years. This is what the pack is howling about. Which is greater, their stupidity or their hypocrisy? The working masses of occupied Vorvorts, the, the brutal provocations of Ebert in recent days, put the patience and kindness of the greater Berlin workers through severe tests. To leave such a dangerous weapon in the hands of the enemy of the revolution any longer would indeed amount to the betrayal of the most vital interests of the revolution. Here we have a red flag cheering on soldiers seizing the bourgeois press with the justification of protecting the revolution. I think it's fair to say that Rosa, much like the Bolsheviks, weren't interested in making the lives of the counter-revolution so easy as to let them print papers and leaflets onto Rosa's position on terror. All this resistance must be broken step by step with an iron fist and ruthless energy. The violence of the bourgeois counter-revolution must be confronted with the revolutionary violence of the proletariat against the attacks insinuations and slanders of the bourgeoisie must stand the inflexible clarity of purpose vigilance and ever-ready action of the proletariat mass against the threatening dangers of the counter-revolution the arming of the people and the disarming of the ruling class the fight for socialism is the mightiest civil war ever in world history. The proletariat revolution must procure the necessary tools for the civil war. It must learn to use them to struggle and to win. Such arming of the solid mass of laboring people with all political power for the task of the revolution, that is the dictatorship of the proletariat and therefore true democracy, not where the wage slave sits next to the capitalist, the rural proletariat next to the Junker in fraudulent equality, to engage in parliamentary debate over questions of life or death, but where the million-headed proletarian mass seizes the entire power of the state in its calloused fists, like the god Thor and his hammer to smash the head of the ruling class. That alone is democracy. That alone is not a betrayal of the people. Here we have Rosa calling for the state power to be wielded like Thor to smash the ruling class. These are not the words of someone who hates the state or is against using it. I think it's pretty easy to see that much of the painting of Rosa being an opposition or some sort of anti-Leninist, anti-Bolshevik, or opposed the state is pretty clearly false. She did not agree with Lenin on everything, but where she did disagree with Lenin, often her opinions were shared by a section of the Bolshevik party. My point is not that Rosa agreed with Lenin, but that Rosa Luxemburg's opinions were well within the realm of the opinions of the Bolsheviks, and is very much of that tradition. I'm going to end with a quote from Rosa from the end of the Russian Revolution. This is the, th the essential enduring in Bolshevik policy. In this sense, there's the immortal historical service of having marched at the head of the international proletariat with the conquest of political power and the practical placing of the problem of the realization of socialism and having advanced mightily the settlement of the score between capital and labor in the entire world. In Russia, the problem could only be posed. It cannot be solved in Russia. And in this sense, the future everywhere belongs to Bolshevism. So hopefully my next video about Breslatovsk should be out soonish. It's very likely it could end up being more like 40 minutes to an hour, um, which is kind of long, but there's a lot to cover. 